No, I thank you, and, and there's a reason for that. I'm going to show you in a few slides why. Um, first, a question. How many printers do you think HP makes a year? Wait, another question. Are there any HP folks in the audience? <laughs> if you're here, you can't answer, but for the rest of the people, how many printers do you think HP ships a year? Just shout it out. 50 million. A billion. A billion. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so it turned out it was very difficult to get this figure from a technical person at HP, but if you just follow the money, Wall Street knows exactly how many printers everyone ships out. And if you look at the precision, 879, I mean, down to the single printer. So this is um, how many units uh, HP shipped uh, second quarter of 2010. Um, if you multiply that out, that's about 40 million printers per year. If you multiply that out, you know, since 2005, right, we're talking about hundreds of millions of these laser jet printers. Um, this slide answer, answers why I chose HP printers for my project, because they are 41% of the global market as far as printing goes, right? So they're the biggest player, uh, and they're everywhere. So I'd like to read an excerpt I found after I finished my project. Uh, I was looking through HP's um, security Solutions white paper from 2006. Um, a concerned citizen asks, are current HP multifunction printers uh, susceptible to worms and viruses? And HP says, no, silly, um, because most of the viruses and worms on the internet attack uh, Windows-based operating systems, and because H HP MFPs use non-standard operating system, okay, these worms and viruses are not going to affect our products. And as if this person didn't really believe that first answer, he wrote a second question, follow-up. Are you sure? Right? Does this mean that HP MFPs are completely safe from worms and viruses? And HP says, well, no, okay, but hackers are more likely to be interested in exploiting vulnerabilities in workstations and servers uh, since they are more widespread and require less expertise. Okay. So this is really my first slide, and I have about 100 slides after this that's going to make this first slide really funny. Um, <laughs> before I do that, I'd like to give a big thanks to um, Jetin Kataria, uh, my advisor, Sal Stofo, and John Boris, who helped a lot with this project and made this presentation possible. Um, a little bit of background history. I finished most of the, the technical portion of this project at the end of August, or no, October, right? And, you know, I showed the vulnerability, I showed the impact of, of the vulnerability to a few folks in Columbia, and we actually sat down and realized that the impact was a little bit more um, dangerous than I even thought, you know, when, when I first started the project. So we agreed that it wouldn't be responsible to come to a place like this and give out all the technical details about the exploit without doing two things, right? So first, contacting HP and getting HP's attention, and second, really contacting HP and really getting their attention. <laughs> so. We did one of two, or we did two things. We first, um, you know, got a hold of a few good people in the HP security group, and you know, we got to work explaining the vulnerability to them. But we also reached out to a resource uh, in MSNBC, who came to the lab. You know, I showed him my demo. I explained the impact of this vulnerability. Right? I didn't tell him really any technical details, so I couldn't count that as a disclosure of the vulnerability. But you know, he got enough of what was possible. And he eventually went home and wrote a newspaper article. And this was the headline, right? Millions of printers open to devastating hack attack. Uh, I was really excited. You know, I wanted to read this paper, read this article when it came out. So I set an alarm for 7.30 in the morning, right? I got up, I read this article. You know, the title was a little pizzazzy, but you know, the article actually hit most of the points that I wanted to, to get people to understand. More or less satisfied, I go to sleep, right? I, I don't wake up until 12.30. And I look at my phone, and my phone's blown up just from random people you know, messaging me saying, OMG, Ang, you're on Gawker, right? And I think, oh, this can't be good. <laughs> um, so from 7.30 to about like, 1 in the afternoon, <laughs> this story turned into this story. Okay, could hackers... Um, <laughs> And okay, this is Gawker, you would expect something like this, but flaming death bomb is a little bit of a hyperbole. <laughs> and I, I found this one that I liked because it was 
it starts out really reasonable. You know, it says, can hackers really use HP printers to steal your identity? Thinking, yes, this is what I'm talking about. Somebody's got it. And then it goes to, and blow up your house. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's how the first day ended. It was, it was a headache. You know, I'm just thinking like, we're missing the point here. And when you see the actual vulnerability, you'll, you'll realize uh, not only that fire is not possible, and I'm going to tell you exactly why, but if you had perfect control of this printer, the last thing you would want to do is destroy it, right? It's a very valuable asset for you. Now, that was the first day. Here's the second day, okay? And this, this is when security gets really exciting. I had no idea that I could just... There was a lot of smacking and spanking and, ugh. I'm not going to read all of it, but it ends with, HP Memo spanks Columbia researcher over flaming printer flap. You have to say that really fast. Um, so I'm thinking, oh, geez, I'm getting spanked. It's awesome. <laughs> and then, I just want to show you one more. This is my favorite one, okay? It's funny for two reasons. HP hit with lawsuit over flaming printer hack. Turns out, first reason why this is funny, a lawyer had read all the articles from day one and day two, okay, without contacting any of us at Columbia, filed a class action lawsuit against HP just by reading Gawker and such. <laughs> That's funny, but I actually read the class action lawsuit that was filed, and it really had nothing to do with flaming printer at all. But it didn't prevent Wired from writing this article. So, you know, there's that saying, right? Don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. And this is a, a good example of that. Um, to be fair, there were some folks who did get the gist of what I was trying to say, and they did write more or less level-headed articles about what the actual vulnerability is with these printers. And you're going to see for yourself, we're going to have live demonstrations of everything that I've done. Um, and hauling these printers from the United States is just pain in the arse. And we're not going to haul it back. So I'm going to donate these printers to the hardware hacking area downstairs as my housewarming party to CCC. So if you want to get your hands on some hardware and, and play with it, come find us after the talk downstairs. Um. So this is why I need to thank you guys. Okay? My original security disclosure was done on November 21st. On December 23rd, HP released 56 new firmwares. I'm not talking about device drivers. Printer firmwares for 56 of their printer models, ranging from devices that are introduced on the market from 2005 to 2000 now. And I think you know, this is a pretty speedy response, and I think this quick turnaround probably had nothing to do with the fact that I'm standing here in front of you guys talking about the technical details about this vulnerability on December 29th. So, you know, this happened in part because you guys are here, you exist, and you care. So this is great. Um, here's a list of all the printers that are affected by this vulnerability, uh, at least according to HP. And these are the printers that have new firmware released on the December 23rd. So if you learn anything about what I'm saying today, learn that go home, check your printer, update your firmware, it's really important. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this research in context, who I am, why I'm doing this, and you know, why this is all happening. I'm a fourth year PhD student uh, in the Intrusion Detection Systems Lab at Columbia University. And here are, here's a list of my past publications in various academic conferences. And if you read the titles of these, these papers, you can quickly see a pattern to what I'm doing. Right? For the last three and a half, four years, I've been basically quantifying and qualifying the nature of embedded, embedded insecurity. Um, on the quantification front, I created this thing called the Vulnerable Embedded Device Scanner. It basically continuously monitors IPv4 space for things that I call trivially vulnerable embedded devices. Uh, long story short, there's about 1.4 million embedded systems that, that ranges from backbone routers, uh, pop routers, home routers, and IP phones, teleconferencing units, printers, etc., that are publicly reachable on the internet and are configured with their default root passwords. Right? In other words, one in five embedded devices on the internet right now can be exploited without any exploitation. You just log in with your default password and you get root on that box. So there's 1.4 million of these. 
Um, and after I did the RFU vulnerability, uh, RFU attack on HP printers, I turned the scanner onto the vulnerable printer population, and it turns out that there are over 75,000 vulnerable, unique vulnerable HP printers out there on the internet right now. And I'm going to show you guys some interesting distribution of you know, where these things are, who's using them, et cetera. And on the qualifying front, I've been working on various exploit or offensive techniques for exploiting uh, embedded systems. And I've basically done this in a, in a bi-directional approach, right? looking at things from the top-down and the bottom-up perspective. Top-down, I'm talking about things that make up the internet substrate, right? the big iron routers that hold the internet together. And from the bottom-up perspective, I'm looking at you know, common embedded systems that are connected on the periphery, right? on networks that you have at home, at work, in your school. So um, the top-down stuff, I did some interesting work on Cisco IOS um, shellcode techniques. And that was presented in Black Hat of this year. And today, we're talking about exploitation for printers. Right? This is something that you all have, you've all used in the past year. And chances are, if, you, if you've used a printer this year, you probably used an HP printer. And all this work is done so we can answer some really fundamental questions about the nature of embedded insecurity, right? Like, can embedded systems be compromised? Okay, I'm standing here, I'm talking to you. I don't think I have to work very hard to ex convince you that the answer to this question is yes, of course. These are written uh, with code that's vulnerable. They're, they're much like general purpose computers, except they're just single function, right? But if you answer yes to this question, few other tricky questions necessarily follow. Like, you know, have embedded systems been exploited in the past? And more importantly, have your embedded systems been exploited in the past or right now? And really, how do you know for sure? Right? So just imagine your office, you have your computer, you have your printer, you have your little LCD picture frame doodad that's on the wireless network, you have a TiVo and a top set box and a wireless access point and a teleconferencing unit. They all seem to work just fine, right? But how do you know that there's no malware running on that device, right, secretly sneaking information out of your network or you being used as a backdoor for other people to come in and pwn your entire network. It's not like we have antivirus for embedded systems, right? So I want to pause, I want you to think about what that means and why it is that we don't have antivirus for embedded systems. We're going to get back to that thought at the end of my presentation. And here is an even trickier question, okay? So suppose I told you that your printer has been owned, okay? through maybe the, the vulnerability that I'm going to show you today. Can you be sure that you can really remove the malware once the malware has been uh, installed on your printer? Now, cleaning up a general purpose computer is, is tricky, but you know, more or less it can be done for most things. But I'm going to show you some techniques that's going to make cleaning up printer malware very difficult to potentially impossible. Okay. So with that said, let's talk printers. Okay, this is the printer that I did most of my research on, and we have a pair of these on stage, and we're going to show you some live demos. This is the HP uh, 2055DN. Um, and just for the record, we bought these in what middle of September or October of this year. So, you know, they're definitely on the market, and they're definitely still vulnerable. Um, here is a puzzle, a Cohen, okay? How does printer update firmware? So you have to imagine that you're a printer, you're on the network, sometimes you print pages out, and once in a while, you update your own programming. What is the most zen way to do this? Right? You print to it. Right? I'm flipping through HP's manual, and I see this. Remote firmware update using LPR command. So I look at that, and I say, hmm, it's probably not a good idea. Right? I click on the link, and it's basically a page that explains how to use LPR in the most user-unfriendly way possible. Right? But basically, all it's saying is, if you want to update firmware on your magical printer, just type LPR and some magical .rfu file, right? If it prints to the printer, then the firmware is magically changed. So for folks who know what happens after you press LPR, okay, you can already see where this is going, and it's not going to be good. Um, okay, so I look. What is this magical RFU file that you're talking about? I go to HP's website. I download this file, right, from... You know, this is for my version of the printer, which is P25 or 2055DN. I look at it and I say, ah, this looks a lot like just a bunch of PJL commands. Uh, the first one is a comment. You can throw that away. The second one is this where is it? PJL, upgrade size equals blah. And then this is followed by just a, a third 
HL command that enters into this mysterious ACL language, right? Um, so if you play this stare at the binary blob game for long enough, you'll realize that the thing that actually changes the firmware is a PJL command, uh, which stands for printer job language. Um, it's a single PJL command, and it's a single seven megabyte long PJL command, and that seven megabytes is compressed and not encrypted. And I figured this just by looking at the byte distribution, looking at the entropy of the data, and it's very typical for a compressed file and not an encrypted file. And I started flipping bits in this command and sending it to the printer, and it turns out this entire command is covered by integrity checking. But the big question now is, is there a mechanism that stops me from crafting my own uh, PJL command? Because if I can do that, I can just print to a printer and update the firmware in a permanent way, right? And one way that, you know, th that would stop this from working is digital signature verification. So do they use dig signatures? So here's a lazy way to sort of approximate. Um, instead of reverse engineering the whole thing right away, I just look at the, the service manual and I look at all the error messages that this printer can produce, right? So if it does check for signatures, you would expect to see something like, you know, signature verification failed, right? Didn't see anything like that. The only thing I was able to see was code CRC error, send full RFU on port. Now this is a fairly technical output, right? So I'm gonna go on a limb and say, you know, CRC doesn't mean digital signature and CRC actually means CRC. Um, okay, so let's just review something obvious about what we've just talked about. Uh, when you hit LPR, right, that RFU file is sent to the raw printing queue, usually, um, on an HP printer, and that, once you go to that queue, the file is sent unmodified, unconverted to, let's say, port 9100 on the printer, right? And this mechanism, TCP port 9100, raw printing, has absolutely no uh, authentication mechanism, right? If you can print a page, it'll just let you print. There's nothing that says, oh, you want to print a page, please enter username and password. Doesn't exist. And this thing that updates the firmware is a PJL command. Now, it's very easy to embed PJL commands inside PostScript files, right? But if you just thought about it a little bit harder, you can probably figure out all sorts of ways of sneaking this valid PJL command into all sorts of different file formats. And if you put one and two together, right, Suppose you're able to uh, craft your own malicious RFU. What you would get is printer malware, right? It's bad, it's not that bad. But if you have malicious RFU plus some sort of a document attack vector, okay, you get something much worse or much better, I don't know. Um, well, so first of all, you can use this as a spear phishing attack, right? So suppose I want to penetrate, you know, super duper secret co, right, and they have um, just hardcore perimeter defense and, and gun, guys with guns guarding their base, right? But they're also hiring. So I put a resume, you know, with, along with this malicious RFU, I package it together and I send it to HR. HR says, oh, this guy is not an idiot. Let's print out his resume and consider him, right? What happens then is the printer will print out my resume and again, begin to update its firmware. And from that point on, I have a persistent foothold into super duper secret co. And what if I made a backwards TCP connection out to the internet to my laptop? All of a sudden, I've just penetrated the firewall. I have a persistent foothold from internet through the firewall to the printer. And now I can run all my um, reconnaissance and attacks from a printer, right? Which is usually not monitored by IDS. So this is the perfect thing to do. And this is why if you had this, you would not burn it, okay? You would save it and you wouldn't destroy it. <laughs> and another thing to think about is, so suppose I had this attack vector plus I combined it with an existing botnet code for, let's say, uh, general purpose computers, right? All of a sudden we're talking about multi-species propagation, right? You can imagine, let's say, you know, I get onto your PC using some sort of you know, an old day, and then I'll find all the printers on the network, and then I own those printers. And from there, right, I would use the printers to scan and own other PCs to put my malware back onto those PCs. So this is something that can spread from computer to printer, printer to computer, and something like that is going to be really very difficult to eradicate. Okay, so all of this depends on ability for me to, uh, my ability to reverse engineer the RFU format and craft arbitrary code into this thing. Um, if you want to do something like this, I'll save you a week of your life. This is what didn't work, okay? So you can just skip all that stuff. Um, 
Staring at the blob worked okay, but it only gets you so far. Binwalk is a great tool that is supposed to um, interpret firmware in all sorts of different ways and give you hints about what is actually potentially in this data. For whatever reason, Binwalk actually failed in this case. Um, trying to find standard file system headers, not there because the data is compressed, right? And Googling didn't work because if you just Google HP, PGL, ACL, it's not going to come up with anything. At, at this point, I think this is the middle of September, we actually went to HP. A little back, background story. The reason why I wanted to do this in the first place was because I have this project that's essentially antivirus for embedded systems. My thing is that I can inject this antivirus in an OS agnostic way into embedded systems. Now, we contacted HP to say, you know, we're, we're trying to put antivirus on your printer. Can you, A, give us your proprietary RFU format, and B, uh, you know, get back to us soon? And of course, they said, no thanks, go away. We don't want anything to do with you. So <laughs> we went back to the drawing board. And I noticed this, so I started twiddling with this RFU. And it's pretty easy to break the printer. But it was also really easy to unbreak the printer. All you have to do is turn the power off, right? hold these two special keys in the, in the combination on the front control panel, and the boot code would actually boot back up, and it would rewrite all of the NVRAM content back to a pristine factory reset. So it basically just does a clean slate factory reset. So I start getting this idea. Okay? So if I can get physical ac I mean, the answer is in that box. Right? So if I can get physical access to the boot code, I should at least be able to see how I can write the NVRAM. And if I get lucky, I should probably be able to see some code that tries to parse or validate an RFU file. And if I have that, I should be able to get some sort of specification for this thing and then figure out how I can pack my own code into this format that's very mysterious. All right, so I hit the service manual. This is a page of the circuit diagram for the P2055. And you'll notice that there are two uh, big rectangles, right? The formatter board and the control PCA. And there's this little thing here. And I want to just take a moment to digress and just say, OK, the, all the printer fire stories just got it totally wrong. If anything, we proved in our lab that you cannot turn a printer into a flaming death bomb. And here's why. OK, this is something I wrote to my advisor, slid it under his door, and I say, this little thing here is a ceramic heater. It's good for fire, right? But here are these thermal switches that cut off when things get too hot, and that's bad for fire. And in fact, um, I brought the, the original sheet of paper, OK, that you, you, maybe you saw in the YouTube video. I put the fuser on the, in this printer, hooked it up to a 24-volt uh, 10 amp power supply, put this piece of paper on, um, stood there and watched for 15 minutes, and this is how it burned. It just browned the paper. Okay, so fire on this thing really not that possible. You can actually look at it if you want. I'm pass it around in the crowd. Um, you want it? But I, I think my advisor do, wants it back. We're gonna make a t shirt out of it, I think. But anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> We looked at, you know, I, I went through and looked at about six different models of printers, and generally this is the design that I was able to figure out. Okay, in the HP printer, there's actually two microcontrollers at work, at least two. The, the formatter board is where most of the um, general purpose computing happens. This is where your web server runs, this is where your telnet server, uh, your format conversion, blah, 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 right? Your SNMP, LDAP, SIFs, just everything. Um, so if you wanted to write malware that's useful, this is probably the place where you want to live. But there's also a second microcontroller called the Engine Controller Board. Okay. This microcontroller is also uh, programmable, it seems like, through the RFU format. And this is the thing that actually keeps track of you know, turning on and off the, the engines and, and the little rollers, putting the paper at the right place, turning on the laser, turning on the heater and the fuser and all this stuff. So this is where the real-time printing mechanism is controlled. And on this formatter board, you have your usual NIC controller. Uh, some piece of memory that you boot from, um, volatile memory, and in some cases, persistent storage. Okay, so now I'm starting to rip apart the printer, right? This is how I destroyed the first one. Uh, but I got this information. Um, the formatter board is, is ARM, okay? It's this chip here, 88PA2AL2-TAH1. Um, long story short, I spoke to dozens of yield pirates in Asia 
trying to get the data sheet for this chip, but this is protected by NDA. So I can buy thousands of these chips, and they can send me pictures of their stock, and they can sell it to me for you know, just a few cents per chip, but nobody can even give me a pinout of the chip that they're trying to sell me. Um, and there are lots and lots of these vendors. It's really fascinating. Um, but the rest of the board, there was one thing that actually made uh, my job really easy, and it's the Spansion FL064P. Right? And it turns out that that's a flash chip. That's a flash chip that the printer boots off of when you do a factory reset. So here's what the formatter board looks like you know, in real life. This socket thing with Bob, I soldered on myself. Right? And this is after I learned how to do surface mount soldering. I'll show you some pictures of what I did before I had a higher rework station. Um, but I did this so I can actually switch different uh, flash chips in and out to have the thing boot up in different ways to poke at the hardware. Um, okay, so this is the data sheet that I was able to pull off of DigiKey or somewhere for the flash chip. So this is just a very standard SPI interface, right? This is a stock component. So for example, if you want to read some memory address, you just send a one byte com uh, command followed by three bytes of target address, and you just wait on the output pin for the contents of that address, right? Pretty simple. Um, I also want you guys to keep to look at this, the write control. Right? You can actually lock pages in this flash chip. Keep that in mind. That's going to be important for later. <clears throat> so you know, I, I take the chip off. I look at the pinout. It looks like exactly the same chip I have on the board. So I basically you know, send my read commands in here, and I wait for the output here. Right? And if I could do that, I can just you know, dump the, the, the content of the boot chip and then figure out how this thing actually boots up and write to NVRAM, et cetera. So I bust out my trusty old Arduino. Okay, I built this very simple SPI dumper, basically just 40 lines of code. I mean, it's really not that big. Wrote a small Python script to control the Arduino so I can get the data back, save it to a file on my laptop, and analyze it in IDA Pro. OK, this is what I built first. You see how I just have no idea how to solder on a PC board. Um, this is my monkey soldering. I basically just got the pins straight to the Arduino. And it worked, but it, was, it worked terribly. And it wasn't reliable at all, and just got all sorts of noise. So I gave myself a B minus for this effort. Um, and then I have attempt two. Same thing, same mon monkey soldering. Got the chip off of the board, taped it, duct taped it to my desk, threw up a lot of duct tape, uh, and it worked perfectly. Right? So this is how I got A plus with just massive amounts of duct tape. Um, <laughs> So after a couple hours, right, I, I come back to my laptop and I slurp this into IDA Pro, and I start looking at the strings and the code in, in the boot sector, um, and I make some very interesting observations. So first, the code thinks that the, the chip that it boots off of is a boot SPI ROM, okay, ROM, but we, it's obviously not because this is writable. It's a flash chip. Uh, the chip has eight megabytes of capacity and it has a small bootloader, and right after the bootloader actually is a a small factory reset RFU. This is just a minimum feature set RFU that's meant to get you back in the network, the web server back running, so you can actually start you know, updating the firmware that you want. And look at there. So the RFU parser, right? because it needs to you know, read this RFU, the RFU parser is actually in the boot code. Right? So if I can just sit there and reverse engineer like this much random ARM code, I would be able to figure out the format of the RFU. And this is the content of the, the ROM right, right after the bootloader. And I noticed this funny little sequence here, the UAT sequence. Right? I remember maybe seeing that before. So I think, mm, let's look around. Here is the, the slide that I showed you, you know, five minutes ago in the beginning. Right? Can you guys spot where UAT is? Yeah, it's right here. It's right underneath ACL. So I'm thinking, ah, you know, if this thing is parsed, Right? And it has a UAT header and looks a lot like the same format as this. So maybe the bootloader code okay, will parse the thing I downloaded from HV's website too. Right? So I start reversing the code and I start getting these hints and just staring at it a little bit more, I figured out some structure to this code. First of all, okay, so if you look at upgrade size, okay, this is obviously decimal represented in ASCII. You convert this thing into a hex and you get 790032, which is Super close to a nice round number, right? 790000. So I'm thinking, well, what is this 32 all about, right? 50. Um, you shift and realign. 
So I throw away the first two commands, right? I throw away the PGL comment and the upgrade size, and then I jump to byte 50 inside the actual command that parses the, the RFU. Sorry. No, no, this is that's an image. I can't. Sorry. Um, look closer. <laughs> but anyway, so right, if you jump to uh, you know, byte 50, you get UAT. Ah, so things are really starting to f fit together, right? So there's a 32 or well, 50 byte header, and the rest of it is the rest of the payload. Um, shift again for realignment. Now I look at the first two words before the UAT header. Right? I read zero for the first word, and zero zero seven nine zero 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 zero. Right, so things are really starting to fit. Uh, these things are starting to converge. So this is this looks like you know the format of this binary string. Right, you have the start address and address, this mystery header, and then various payload, which describes the structure of the rest of the thing, which contains multiple compressed files for you know the update package. Now at this point. We've talked, to Columbia, or we've talked to HP and various Columbia folks, and we've agreed to uh, not release the checksum algorithm and not release the, the UAT header format until folks have more time to go home and update their firmware. Like I said, the firmware released on December 23rd, but that's you know, not enough time for people to do this and roll it out and test it. My goal for this presentation is to convince you that this vulnerability is real, right? It's, ex it's exploitable, and I want you guys to go home and tell everyone that it's time to upgrade your printer firmware. So, with that said, I start you know, scrubbing through the rest of the data, or the data section in the, in the bootloader, and I find this. You know, I'm thinking, yes. Right? Verify firmware key, super secret bypass of crypto key enabled. Now, like, I don't care what this thing does, I have to use it in my project. Um, <laughs> because that's just this, such a good freebie. Um, it turns out I didn't actually have to even use the super crypto, super secret crypto bypass. But here's what I did, you know, so I, I figured out the RFU format. I was able to unpack and pack all of the, uh, the firmwares that are available for download. And made some observations about what's inside this RFU. Now, I can't tell you the, the compression algorithm, right? But I can tell you that the specific version of the compression library that is compiled into this printer has a known stack-based buffer overflow. Um, whether that's ex you know, exploitable for ARM, you know, that's another story, but at least there's a known bug in the, the boot code of this printer. And what's inside the RFU is essentially just a VXWorks operating system, right? It doesn't have the MMU edition, doesn't have any memory separation whatsoever, no kernel level security, right? And everything basically runs a supervisor mode on the CPU, which means if you have a vulnerability that gets you arbitrary code execution, you win and you win completely on the whole device, right? A vulnerability like this. So, but then I thought, oh, you don't even have to do that, right? Because we can just walk through the front door and use, and not exploit a, a bug, but just use a feature, right? The RFU update standard is a feature that is supported in all of these laser jet printers. So this is actually a much better way to do it because it's more you know, reliable than you know, exploiting a, a very specific version of a library. Okay, so let's talk about the proof of concept. You know, John's gonna warm up and do his thing. Um, the actual packer that packs arbitrary RFUs right, for this demo is 200 lines, exactly 200 lines of Python. And this includes comments, spaces, commented out crap. And I just want to brag a little bit that I actually wrote a unit test for this thing. So I'm really <laughs> proud of myself. Um, what, what you're about to see is essentially a VXWorks rootkit. Now, I know there's got to be better ones out there, but you know, I didn't know anything about VXWorks when I started, so I wanted to write my own. This is basically 3K of ARM assembly, and it really has two features that we're going to show you in the demo. The first one is a print job duplicator. I mean, it, it, it intercepts, but it basically duplicates the job that gets sent to the victim printer, and it, it forwards it onto uh, another IP address. And the second one that you're gonna see is a reverse IP proxy, right? Like I said before, suppose I got this malware on a printer in super duper secret co, um, but I can't get access into the, the environment inside because of the firewall, this reverse proxy will, well, when the printer boots up, the reverse proxy will activate. It'll connect outward through the firewall to my laptop. And from that point, I can use the printer as a launching off point. I can you know, do, start doing reconnaissance and I can actually what we're going to show you, we're going to show um, Metasploit 
working through this IP tunnel, and we're going to get root shell on that XP desktop laptop thing about over there, all through the printer. Um, so to put all this, thing, all this stuff together, there's two components. There is a RFU packer, which is about 200 lines I just talked about. It takes an arbitrary bin ELF binary, and it spits out a PGL command that you can send to the printer. And the second part is just you know, my Symbio stuff that I reworked to make this thing happen. And really, all it does is cross-compilation the malware code, right? does some binary rewriting, some function hooking. And that input, it takes the original firmware for the printer, uncompressed, and it spits out a modified version of this firmware. Right? So obviously, you take output of this, you feed it back into this, and you get a PGL string that you can use. Um, I included some details for people that may want to do this, but it's really not for reading. But I want to show you this. Okay? Some mystery programmer types, and the data section is full of this gold. I mean, you, got, you have to just read through it, I think. Uh, do not type plah. You will end up uh, inside a small building with keys on the ground. So I, I saw this <laughs> at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I thought maybe some mystery programmer wrote this three o'clock in the morning many years ago. So, like, I, I hear you. You're out there. Um, so I, this is a slide that I want to show you. Okay, this is an important detail. This is my main make file. Okay, it's two lines. All it does is call pack the firmware right with the prefix that you want, and then LPR the firmware to the printer. So this is basically print to pwn right? You do this, and it just sends the thing to the printer, and it'll work. OK, so we're ready for the demo. And I just want to say we did sacrifice the demo gods. Because uh, I got, so I got checked all my equipment is OK with 240 volt, except for the, the little volt, um, power strip. So I plugged that in, smoke everywhere in my hotel room. The electrician from the hotel comes up, and we're just like, I don't know why like, none of my sockets work in my room. Like, can you take a look? So we actually bought this guy, which I also blew up. We returned that and bought two more. Um, so we're going to show you the demo now. All right, the first demo we're going to show is the print job replicator. Okay, so basically what's going to happen is, oh, so first let me explain a little bit about the, the network topology here, right, so this makes sense. This red cable here represents internet, okay? This is the only thing that connects this stuff to this stuff. Down here is a Cisco router that we're going to call our perimeter firewall. Right? This is a compromised printer that's behind the corporate environment. We have um, this XP machine that we're going to try to own through the printer. And John is an employee of Super Duper Secret Co., so he's going to print his tax return on that printer because he likes to pay taxes. All right. Yeah. All right. And now what's going to happen is that the tax return is going to be sent to this printer. Um, but then the printer is going to forward all the packets that it gets to my laptop over there, which is why, where you're seeing the scrolling. And once I read the end of this file, I'm going to forward that to a printer on the internet, and it's going to print the exact same document. Now, in our original demo, we showed that we can tweet your social security number and whatnot, but I don't have internet activity. But hopefully I can convince you that right, doing this is not all that difficult. I can scrub out whatever information I want and exfiltrate it any way I want. Right. So this is all done through this internet cable here. Second one is going to be a little bit more exciting. Okay. So I just want to, you just gave away your tax return. <laughs> all right, so we're going to show you the second one where we're going to use the reverse IP proxy right, to make this printer compromise this machine to get reverse shell back out through the firewall um, here. So what happened here is John just activated the, oh, you touched it wrong. No, oh, sorry. I know what's going on. Yeah. OK. So John just activated the reverse IP proxy, right? He's going to use Metasploit to essentially send the good old MSRPC vulnerability to the laptop's IP address, right, which is then going to forward that packet to the printer, right, and the printer is going to be instructed to forward that packet to this machine here. OK. And now this machine is going to make, we just spawn an interpreter shell back to my laptop through the firewall out on the internet. Do you see that?
Okay? Okay, let's so just re review what we just did. We made a printer pwn a machine to get a reverse shell out on the internet to me. Okay, so this is what can happen if you don't lock down your printers. Um, okay, done. So we did the sacrifice paid off. There was demo guide, huh? Wait a minute. Don't die on me now. <laughs> Oh, come on. All right. <laughs> oh, my God, I hate PowerPoint. Give me a there will be a short intermission. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to try this again. Uh, how do I do full screen on this thing? All right, no more PowerPoint. We're going to just do this PDF style. This is review, so you, you don't forget about what I just talked about. <laughs> totally planned. Um, okay, so we go back to... Yeah. All right, so you saw what the, the, the malware is capable of doing, so let's talk about attack vectors. How do you get this RFU, this malicious code, onto the printer? Okay, there are two obvious ways to do it. One I'm going to call the active method, and one I'm going to call the reflexive method. Active is very simple, okay? So if you can connect, make a network TCP connection to port 9100 on your victim printer, you can do this. You just connect to the port, push this malicious RFU through, kill the TCP connection, and the, uh, the firmware will start updating. And this is true because prior to the December 23rd patch, um, RFU update is turned on by default on all the printers that you saw in that list. And, um, well, doing this through port 9100 has absolutely no authentication mechanism, so if it's on, then anyone who can connect to this printer can do it. Reflexive attack is a little bit more complicated, right? So here, we're embedding the malicious RFU in a document, let's say in a resume, and mailing it to someone and hoping that they'll print it out. But then again, you know, if you're sending a resume or like a gift certificate or something, right, it probably wouldn't be all that difficult. Um, so let's talk about the quantitative scope, okay? This is the PR message from HP right after the public disclosure. And it reads, um, the specific vulnerability exists for some HP laser jet devices if placed on a public internet without a firewall. You know, as if saying, like, well, who on earth would do that, right? Um, actually, 75,000 people did on the planet. <laughs> so we scanned using our scanner for the last month and a half, and we found 76,995 unique vulnerable HP printers on the planet and uh, 43 of these printers belong to governments, and 16 of them belong to the U.S. government. And here's the thing I, I love, okay? There are nine printers on the planet named Payroll. <laughs> and they all belong to universities. And I'm just going to skip, save the question. Yes, one of the Payroll printers is Columbia, and yes, we locked it down, so... You know. <laughs> Okay, and it says, and this is something that you rarely ever read, right? Linux, uh, so in some Linux and Mac environments, it may be possible to do blah, 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 right? This bad thing. But implies that Windows, not possible. So I'm not going to sit here and try to convince you guys that you can't do this in Windows, because anything that prints can do this, and Windows can print, so Windows can do this. But if I have time, I have some really funny backup slides about a support case that I had with Windows to get a bug in Word fixed so this attack would work inside Word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not really that. It was a, a feature that it was supposed to work. Um, but, so let's talk about the quantitative, quantitative scope of the reflexive attack, okay? So we're not talking about, you know, 76,000 printers anymore. We're talking about all the printers that HP shipped that are vulnerable to this attack between, I don't know, like 2005 and 2000 now, right? 
Uh, like I said before, you know, we're not talking, this is not 100,000, this is not a million, right? This is not even 10 million. We're really in the order of hundreds of millions of potentially vulnerable printers. And like I said before, if you think about a malware that takes this, combines it with, you know, takes attack vectors that involve general purpose computers, combine this with, um, let's say, a firmware update attack for embedded systems, right? You can imagine how difficult this thing would be to eradicate. Um, yeah. So let's look at just, I want to give you a feel about how easy the reflexive postscript attack is, okay? This is a standard postscript file. Somewhere in here it describes my resume, right? And when it's done, I just do this very simple thing. I say, EOJ, end of job, okay? And the printer is going to receive this file and says, ah, I am processing postscript file. I am printing postscript file. I have reached end of job. I am going to process new job. I am entering language ACL. I am now updating firmware. Because that's totally reasonable. I am done updating firmware. <laughs> <laughs> and the nice thing about it is, it's actually going to print out the resume. So it's going to be fine. And unless you're staring at the printer, you won't notice that you know, jobs aren't being printed for a minute and a half, which is basically how long this takes to, to work. Right? Um, and for most of this update process, your, your printer actually responds to pings. So it's not like if you constantly ping the printer, you're going to see, oh, this thing went down for a minute and a half. It's about like a 45 second downtime on the network. Um, OK, so everything I talked about here applies to the 2030 and the 2050 model. Um, like as you saw before, HP released 56 firmware. So there are different types of RFU formats out there. They're slightly different, but you know, so if you re repeat the same exercise that I did, it really wouldn't be difficult to figure out the format for the printer that you're, you're interested in. And um, the other day, John and I threw up this little diagram just to see what uh, so we unpacked a lot of HP print, uh, printer firmware, and we just wanted to really quickly see, you know, what's underneath, what our ISA is, right, and what the operating system is. Um, so, you know, it looks like most of them run MIPS, and most of them run this thing called Lynx OS. Don't know very much about either, but, you know, that's what we found. So this idea that, you know, HP printers have a lot of diversity in the software, maybe, but, you know, it looks like there's a lot of shared code, right, in these models here. Um, so here is how you can go home, run home, and verify to see if your printer is vulnerable to this attack or not. Right? Lock down your printer any way you can, every way you can, uh, maybe according to the HP NIST guide, which is actually fairly useful. Um, download the printer RFU for your model and just print to it. Okay? If your firmware changes, you're, you're not okay, and if your firmware doesn't change, you're probably good. Um, and some obvious immediate mitigation, right? You want to disable RFUs. This is actually harder than you think because for most of the, the models I looked at, you can't actually disable the RFU feature from the web interface or the telnet interface. You have to download this thing called WebJet Admin or some other tool, right? And use this massive control software to actually disable RFUs. And, um, well, you probably want to add call off your printers so that only your print server can connect and send jobs to the printer. You probably want to filter some jobs, filter the jobs on the print server. But if you saw Andre Costin's talk yesterday, and you can think about how you can put that together with this and see maybe, you know, Postscript being a Turing complete language, have the Postscript generate on the fly an RFU, which is then printed. So you really can't filter this easily without, right, emulating Postscript on your filter, right? So this is not something that's really going to be that easy to prevent. And of course, okay, most places you can, you can, well, you can't cut off people's access to the internet because they'll probably, if they can't Twitter, they're going to burn the building down. But your printers don't complain, and they don't need to talk to Twitter. Okay, so you should probably segregate your, your printers on a network that is away from the sensitive stuff on internal network and also can't talk to the internet. Right, so this is just a, a good thing to think about. Now, that being said, on the 2055, all of these steps actually prove to be uh, irrelevant. Prior to the December 23rd firmware update, I haven't looked at this update, but with the older version of the firmware before the release, um, there was no way of disabling the RFU update feature, right? either, either in um, the WebJet admin tool or any of the interfaces that I saw. There was also this thing called the PGL password, which is supposed to prevent unauthorized PGL commands, but it didn't actually prevent this command. So you, you can set a password on it, and this one just flow right through. Um, long story short, there's just no way to disable this attack prior to the December 23rd firmware, which is why you should go home and update your firmware print, printer firmware. And 
you need to do this quickly, okay? Because it's a race. So whoever gets on the printer first can probably win forever. And here's why. Now, if I'm the bad guy, right? I generate a malicious RFU. I have it on your printer. The first thing I probably want to do is just disable RFU updates, right? So you can't get rid of me. I could be a little sneaky and just update the, the firmware version strings in the right places. So you think you updated your firmware, right? But I probably won't let you do any more firmware updates. And that's not it. That's not all. I can actually potentially write my malware into the boot flash chip. I remember when I told you about the write controls here, right? So if I could do this, I can probably just lock all the pages. And on some of these flash chips, there's a feature where you can write, where you can lock once permanently. Now, if you can do that, then your malware is physically resident you know, inside this printer. And the only way to get rid of it is to desolder the, the chip from the board. But realistically, you, you, you're going to want to buy a new printer, basically. <laughs> But it's not like you're going to do that because we don't have antivirus for embedded devices. So you won't even know that you've been compromised. Um, OK, so I'm mostly done with my, my presentation. I want to leave you guys with you know, a talk on the bigger picture of embedded defense. Okay, so let's not just think about this immediate vulnerability, but let's just think about the nature of embedded insecurity altogether. Now, HP's reaction, which is very predictable and pretty knee-jerk, is to say, ah, you are arbitrarily crafted malicious RFU, so we're going to prevent you from doing that. We're going to digitally sign all the firmwares, which is one of the features that they rolled out. But I don't have to convince you that you know, sign code doesn't mean secure code, right? Because you're going to go ahead and sign that uh, compression library that has the buffer overflow in it um, that's just going to be a signed vulnerability, right? So it's like you know, putting up your thumb to block out the sun, right? This specific vulnerability won't work anymore, but we can just go back to buffer overflows right, to own the printer. Um, you know, let's use a general purpose analogy. Let, let's say if Microsoft said, you know, we're going to cut off all third-party antivirus and everything that runs on the kernel is going to be just signed, okay? And, but that's okay, don't worry about it. You'd probably say, no thanks. But if HP says the same thing, right, right now this is sort of just accepted as okay. Now, I'm going to say that that's probably not in the right direction, right? So if you really think about real embedded defense and what you want out of it, um, it actually ends up being a lot like just real regular defense, right? You first want host-based defense for these things to exist, right? They don't exist now, they, it should exist. Um, you want this thing to be a well-known defensive mechanism, right? You don't want any more obscure secret sauce, don't worry, you, you'll never guess the magic number type of defense. And you want this thing to be essentially decoupled from the operating system, right? Because the operating system is the untrusted code that you're trying to protect, so you can't really say my operating system isn't secure, but it protects itself. Right. And, you know, OS fortification is a good idea. We should continue to do that. But it shouldn't replace independent security software living on the host on an embedded system. And this is my plug. Okay, this is what I've spent the last three and a half years of my PhD career working on. Uh, I've created this thing called the Software Symbiote. It's something that can inject generic host-based defenses like rootkit detection into arbitrary programs, binary firmwares, in an OS agnostic manner. And we've shown that this does work. We've injected rootkit detectors into many different types of physical Cisco routers across tens of thousands of different iOS versions. Um, and if you actually want to censor it, you want to test it out, please email me privately, because we're actually trying to get people to, to test out our defense and see you know, what's good and what's bad. And uh, I'm hoping that we can do this. I'm hoping I can get back to my original project, which is to put defenses onto printers so this type of attack can happen. And, and hopefully I can do this in 2012. And actually demonstrate that this is not just you know, iOS version independent, but operating system independent. Right? I can get the same defense to work in a router as a printer. So that's it. That's right, funny, right? <laughs> Awesome talk, like it. Um, so we've got uh, 10 minutes for uh, questions, and uh, I believe uh, our uh, audio angel at the back there has uh, the microphone for uh, questions from the audience. So if you have a question, could you put your hand up, please? Um, okay, we'll start with uh, this gentleman here, right at the very back. Uh, well, what sort of formats can you actually embed the malicious code into? Could you, for example, put it in Word doc or PDF file, which are come ah. supplied? 
for printing. Okay, so you know, for my demonstration, I only put it in PostScript, but this is close enough to my backup slide that I want to show you this really funny Microsoft story. So I'm looking at you know all the legit ways I can put PJL commands inside a Word document, and it turns out that there is an actual feature in Word that does exactly this. It's called print field. Okay, and it just does it just put up whatever PJL command you want in the doc, and it can be printed. Now, problem is there was a bug. Anything that was longer than 240 characters introduces random weird character in it. So I'm thinking, well, this is not the specification. I'm going to open a support case with Microsoft and have them fix it. And they tried. Okay, we spent this guy spent two months uh, trying to figure out why it was not okay. What didn't work when I tried to put a seven megabyte PJL command in something that, <laughs> right, in something that it was supposed to support 260 characters, and you know, dozens and dozens of exchanges later, never once did he ask, "Why are you putting seven megabytes of data in this thing? <laughs> it's not supposed to be the way." Um, but actually, HP released a driver update <laughs> on December 1st after we made our disclosure to them. And this guy, poor guy, comes in the office and tries it again. And all of a sudden, this big scary pop-up box comes up and says, you can't do this anymore. Go away. Thanks. Um, long story short, um, well, I haven't tried any other document formats yet, but I think that if you think about the way that the cup server converts your binary, right, as long as you can have your PGL command survive the conversion intact, or have it be generated somewhere in the process and have it survive intact when it's, once it reaches the printer, this is definitely possible, right? Um, exactly which formats it's possible right now, you know, I can't really say, but I, I would expect that many different file formats would be possible with this type of tag. Okay. Um, we'll take this. Ooh, let's see now. Have we got any questions from uh, the from the IRC? Uh, yes. And uh, it's important to uh, support the uh, 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 Yeah, that's a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Um, okay. We'll, we'll go with these guys here because hopefully your questions aren't dumb. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, I have a small note. Basically, the print field command. And Word documents were practically demonstrated like in 2010. Yeah. So that's not news. Uh, but the question is, is like uh, from those fi uh, 56 firmware updates, actually uh, the reason why you cannot disclose the compression algorithm is because they just deployed the fixes with disabling the RFU and still working on the signature yeah. thing, okay. or? Uh, they deployed the signature no. thing, but they, it's not quite. So working. in my slide, I have the, the the link to the exact SSRT. Uh, there were there are two revisions. The second one actually details, I think, something like 20 different printer models have introduced the feature for signature verification, right? The rest of them that had signature verification, it's my understanding. I, mean, I just looked at it, you know, I just read it. Not an HP product person, but I think the rest of them, or all of them, have disabled uh, RFU update by default, right? Um, and some of them, it's actually now possible to de disable RFU updates on those printers like this one. So that's been patched too. Uh, printers where you couldn't disable this feature before, you can now. So this is really important for everybody to go home, check your printer, and just update the firmware. Okay. Um, and I think... Um, you've shown this... Uh, job control language command uh, where you can choose which language the following uh, blob is. Mm -hmm. Have you actually tried uh, using the PostScript console for no, this printer? Right. I just because saw the talk yesterday, so <laughs> I'm going to go home and check it out. Um, actually, so I'm going to take these printers down to the, the hardware hacking area and probably just try that. So, you know, come find me after the talk and we'll find out. Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, more questions. Um, brought it back here. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. So, um, one question is about. Okay, one question is about. So, don't don't put it to my mouth. Okay, I don't want to eat the microphone. Okay. So, uh, my question is about self-modifying code. So, for example, you make uh, they they made made a pop-up box that. Uh, Detects how oh, that you you want to do something evil. So uh, I, at least I understood it that that that. 
I understood like this driver said in the pop-up box, now it's not possible anymore. Yes. Go away. So if you make self-modifying codes, for example, you make this payload uh, maybe XORed by some, 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 some short string, and then you make the self-modifying code into PostScript, and it, right, then, right, it, right, yeah. then it deciphers in the printer memory and then gets executed. Exactly. So, I mean, that's not the only way you can get <coughs> this thing to print through you know, Word. I'm sure there are lots of other ways. I just wanted to use the PGL print code thing because it was cute and it was an actual feature that I thought it would be great if it worked, but it didn't. So, but yes, you know, like that's the thing. You know, I'm going to try out what I heard yesterday and maybe potentially compute right, the RFU on the fly so that filtering would actually be very difficult uh, and maybe have the thing print to itself. Right? Who knows? Maybe that's possible. Hi. What's the chances other printers have these kinds of vulnerabilities? Uh, I can't really, I mean, I don't want to say, I mean, I don't, uh, answers I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me if other printers have this vulnerability, right? Um, I don't think, I think Andre mentioned yesterday that, that Xerox printers, which share a lot of common history, I think, with uh, HP printers, also can update their firmware through, you know, PostScript or PGL interface, so maybe um, Xerox printers, but I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if others have the same vulnerability, basically. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate on your fingerprinting. Are you relying on a, like a version string or what else? What do you mean? What do you mean by fingerprinting? Uh, like you were you were fingerprinting all the printers on the internet. Oh, oh, so I did that um, by a few different ways. You know, by looking at the the web server, the telnet prompt banner, and by looking at there's this actual command that's um, I think P, uh, pjl info prod info on some models of printers it would actually just return the entire. Uh, chassis ID and, and the model number, et cetera. So we put all that data together um, to, find, to figure out this figure. And uh, we have one question here from IRC that's got been voted up a few times and uh, doesn't seem totally stupid. The, the other one was, can you make the printer blow up? And like, it was ah! like, have you actually watched the talk? <laughs> God, be dumb. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, which one? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, okay, um, I've got a question. Um, is there an attack in the wild? You know, this is a really great question, and I, I, I don't think we know. Why? Because we don't have detectors, antivirus for embedded systems to find this type of thing, which is why my original project was to inject right, this type of detector into the printer to fight, figure out if printers have been exploited in the wild, right? And that's exactly what I've been trying to do with the Cisco router. Uh, sensor, because if you think about it, you know this code is very old. We've talked about vulnerabilities for these things. The question is not can they be exploited, but have they been exploited? And if so, how sophisticated is the payload? Right? We don't really know for sure because we have no good way of finding these things, which is exactly why I've been working on the Software Symbiote project. Okay, and I think that's. Uh, I think we're out of time. We've overrun by a couple of minutes, so uh, um, I think it's time for a massive round of applause for uh, the whole team, and especially. Oh, John. John, stand up. John, get up, man. And uh, I, think your, I think your supervisor here needs to stand up and take a bow for, for sponsoring the work.